Who is Korean? This sounds like it's such a self-evident question, but I'll tell you why this is not such a self-evident question by introducing you um, to the story of the Korean Chinese return migrants to South Korea. Tens and thousands of Korean Chinese migrants who wanted to go to South Korea and work. The process itself uh, was completely complicated and also costly uh, for a farmer like Tunggu. So he had to sort of ask his South Korean aunt um, to sort of send all kinds of required documentation to China so that he could apply for, for the family visitation visa. And also he had to bribe Chinese officials so that he could get like all kinds of official documentation from the Chinese government as well. And he had to travel like for a day to uh, the city of Shenyang, where the South Korean consular office was located, just to submit this sort of huge packet, uh, application packet to the South Korean consular office. A week, um, so a week after you know this interview, um, Tunggu just got a notification from the South Korean consular office, sort of telling him that like him, the application was rejected because of this small mistake. They are not really quite convinced this process is so like excessive and burdensome, uh, arbitrary, uh, unfair. In the case of the Korean Chinese, their ancestors actually left the Korean Peninsula when um, Korea was Japan's colony and they became Chinese citizens. They could not really come back after the collapse of the Japanese Empire because of the Cold War. There was basically no contact between the Korean Chinese community and South Korea. But as China started to open its door to the world and also Korea kind of emerged as the sort of economic powerhouse in the region, a lot of Korean Chinese started to migrate back to their ancestral homeland in the 1990s and 2000s. So this is a case of ethnic return migration. But as Dongguz's story shows, right, the South Korean government did not quite like open its border widely to ethnic Korean uh, migrants coming from China. We may predict that uh, migrants with the sort of same and similar ethnic backgrounds uh, are more likely to be welcomed and also they may have easier time adjusting to the sort of new environment because essentially they are returning, they are coming back. But as Dongguz's story shows, that was actually really not the case. Um, the South Korean government was not really quite open to ethnic Korean migrants coming back. So the question was, um, well, should Korean Chinese be treated just like South Korean citizens because they are uh, part of this like broader Korean diaspora, right? Or should they be treated just like foreign immigrants because after all, they are Chinese citizens? What really complicated the question of uh, the national identity of the Korean Chinese even more was the fact that actually their ancestors left the Korean Peninsula before there was North Korea or South Korea. What the government did to establish Korean Chinese ties to South Korea was really sort of focusing on whether or not they had some family relations with South Koreans. So if they could establish their family relations uh, with South Koreans, they, uh, it, it became easier for them to enter South Korea or find jobs in South Korea or even permanently settle or acquire citizenship in South Korea. The problem was establishing this family relation was extremely difficult for many Korean Chinese. It was in part because the South Korean government imposed extremely stringent evidentiary requirement um, on this kind of a claim. So the government initially relied exclusively on official documentation to establish the authenticity of um, the claimed kinship ties. And these official documents included even like decades old colonial era family registries. 
And obviously, a lot of people had found a difficulty sort of providing the kind of official documentation that could prove their relations uh, with South Korean citizens. Korean Chinese also responded to this very restrictive immigration policy by just getting involved in a sort of a massive uh, number of um, so-called immigration fraud, including all kinds of documentary uh, forgery. So the government kind of figured out, oh, this is not really working, right? I mean, we are being criticized. The legitimacy of immigration policies is uh, on the line. And also, it's not really quite working because now people are sort of using all kinds of counterfeit documents. So in response, the South Korean government tried to sort of introduce all kinds of other types of um, evidence. And it included, for instance, the sort of affidavits of um, alleged relative members, um, letters exchanged between the two, or old photos taken together, uh, the family genealogy books called chokbu, um, something like this. And, and also, you know, they sort of tried to do like phone interviews and face-to-face -face interviews um, as introduced by Dongguo's story. But again, as um, his story sort of shows, both Korean Chinese migrants and government officials sort of found that this new sort of verification process not quite effective, but like burdensome, prolonged, and, and, and arbitrary. So after that, the DNA task kind of, sort of emerged as an alternative, uh, but again, it was expensive, so costly for Korean Chinese migrants. So just basically this sort of shifting evidential requirement just to figure out I mean, how we can actually establish Korean Chinese are one of South Korean, sort of the member of the Korean nation, um, just created a booming like market for the migration industry. So all kinds of migration brokers just sort of started to make a lot of money by really selling their expertise in locating um, old relatives uh, or sort of finding some kind of you know documentary evidence for other people korean chinese migration return migration to south korea kind of shows that what it means to be korean is never really a simple question the nation state sort of faces challenge uh, to sort of define who is a member of the korean nation which is the case in the south korean case